chapter 1, verse 2. Here's what the word of the Lord says. His servants advised him that he should have a young virgin to sleep with him and to take care of his needs and to serve as his nurse. She can also sleep with you and keep our master, the king, warm. Verse 3. So they looked through all of Israel for a beautiful young woman and they found a Shudamite and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful. She became the king's nurse and served him. Here's the key. But the king did not have sexual relations with her. Now, if you don't know anything about David, this is, this is amazing. Uh, <laughs> understand something. Okay, I'm, let me see if I can explain this because I don't want to do it during the sermon. When you, when you get ready to die, and, and you will, if the Lord delays his coming, we're all going to die. You know that, right? I don't care how much kale you keep eating. You might live longer, but you won't live forever. And uh, when we die, they put us on machines and, and they look at our vitals and ventilators. And, and when we don't have any signs of life, they pull the plug. They didn't have that then. So, so David's CPR was a virgin because he had slept with so much. <laughs> he had slept with so many women that they knew that if he didn't wake up and try to have sex with her, then that means he was dead. So what I'm trying to tell you is that David not touching this woman was the proof that he was dying. You will know that you have died to your old self when you don't want what you used to want. In other words, there ought to come some point in your life where you are offered something you used to do and you'd be like, I'm too old for that. Oh, uh, y'all ain't gonna say man. Anybody, I mean, if you still doing what you were doing when you were 20 and 30, that, it's at some point in your life, you'll be like, I'm too old to be out every night. Your feet ought to be hurting in them heels that much. <laughs> Let me just give you the sermon topic and explain the rest to you. The name of this sermon is called From Next to Now. I want you to touch everybody on your way down to your seat and say, I'm going from next to now. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. By a show of hands, by a show of hands, everybody who knows the story of David, just let me see your hands. Okay? All right, put them down. This is an honest question. I want you to be honest. If you need me to kind of refresh the story of David, raise your hand so that I can do that. Perfect. David is a young boy who is the proud son of a famous father. His father had eight sons, of which there was an announcement of which one of them would be king. The first king of Israel was a guy named Saul. You remember him? Saul was that guy that stood head and shoulders above the rest. He became king, but you must understand if you read 1 Samuel chapter 10, even though he was king, he was not God's choice. For the scripture specifically says the people chose him. I don't want to get too far to let you know that there are some places you have God doesn't have for you. You were chosen by a person. And any position you have that God did not give you, he is not obligated to keep you in it. So the Bible says that when Saul was small in his own eyes, in other words, when he was humble, God said, even though you are not my choice, I would allow them to choose you, not because you are my choice, but because you are humble. Some doors you can get in because you are humble. Touch your name and say, sit down and be humble. Keep your ratchet in right now, because I see some of y'all starting to crank it up. Hold on, wait till the end. When when the king shows up, you understand that when, when Samuel was anointed king, the Bible says that he was anointed out of a vial. It was a, a glass contraption of which Samuel specifically just popped the top and poured the oil on him and it flowed. But this time, when it's time to anoint this king, he says, I don't want you to anoint this king out of a flask. I want you to anoint this king out of a horn. 
And the reason why he does that is because a flask is a man-made object that was a man-made king. So this time, David is the one, as Samuel is crying and saying, we have lost our king, God shows up in chapter 16 and says, stop crying over Saul. I have chosen me another king, and this time I want you to put the oil in a horn, a horn which was removed from an animal, a live animal, a real animal, because this is a real king. Noticing that the oil represents the one who's going to receive it. And when he got around the sons, the Bible says that Samuel begins to take the oil and he found Eliab, which was the tallest and the most handsome son, and he begins to pour the oil on him. But the problem was is that the oil would not flow because God will never allow the oil to flow on your bad choices. I think it's going to be tight but right up in this spot today. He, he'll allow you to choose it, but he won't allow the oil to flow. And, and the moment uh, he says, he says, uh, uh, he says I, I can't get the oil to flow. He says, Jesse, I've tried it on all of your sons and the oil won't flow, but God sent me here and I know I'm in the right place, but, 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 and I know what God told me is true. Why is it the oil flowing? He says, I have a question. Do you have another son? He said, yeah, he out there in the back somewhere. You don't want him, he's, he's young, he got freckles on his face, his hair is red, he smells like sheep dung, I don't want him. He said, but God told me to get here. He said, can you just bring him here? I just want to try him out a little bit. The Bible says he brings him in the house and he pours the oil and it begins to flow. His ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. I came to tell somebody in here today before I get deep in the sermon, God will make you his choice even when somebody else didn't. Give your neighbor a high five and say, I might not be your choice, but I thank God that I'm his. So now David is king. But he is not king without haters because ever since he's had the job, somebody's been trying to take it. Huh. Some of y'all want to be king but don't want haters. They come with the job. You're not going to be the supervisor and the employees like you. I promise you this, that everybody you go out to eat with at lunch right now, the moment you become their boss, you will become a part of their conversation. David is now king, but he is sent back to the field because God tests him the way he will test us to see, can I give you new oil and you be not too arrogant to do what you used to do? Are you anointed enough to have a new opportunity and still be able to go back where you started? You know, some people, most of us grew up in the hood, but some of y'all been living in the suburbs so long now, you don't want to go back. You know, I don't drive over there in the night. It's dark and dangerous, and I don't do it anymore. Man, you better get on out of here. You used to eat bologna sandwiches over there and fry them in a cast iron, a cast iron pot. You used to go over there, and you don't act like your mama ain't never made you no sugar sandwich. Y'all ain't never had one of those where you put the, the butter on it and then sprinkle the sugar on it? put it in the oven for about 35, 45 seconds, but you can't, you can't leave it because it'll be burnt. And if it is burnt, you're just going to. People see your glory, don't know your story. They sit next to you right now and they look at you and they know you drove up to church in a nice car and you got on nice clothes and, and your hair is done, but they missed all of those days where you were doing your fingernails in the kitchen and doing your hair in the bathroom and, and almost burnt your scalp with a hot comb. Y'all ain't, some of y'all got some burns under your hair right now that ain't never gonna erase because of all them hot combs when your mama got too close to them edges. How many, how many of y'all mama used to press your hair? Mm -hmm, you was doing this, Tommy. You know your hair was stiff. I remember one time I wanted, I wanted, uh, wanted to look smooth. I was younger, my, you know, my hair is good, but it ain't great. You know, it curled all the way over. And 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 one time I wanted to have me some waves, so I went and got me an S curl. Oh, don't hot. Yep. Mm -hmm. I got me one of them S curls, man. And, 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 and when I went to school the next day, had them waves, and I used to put that sporting wave grease in it. 
and I had me a wave cap. I used to wear my wave cap so much, it was a line right here. How many of y'all see? Dude, 50 years old, still got a line right here. You keep... Before I had the money to get a wave cap, I used to take my mama old stockings, cut off that end and put a little knot on the top. Y'all ain't... And, 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 and I was grateful when she went to knee highs. You see, y'all don't know nothing about this. It used to be a time you come to church, all the women had on stockings and knee highs. White stockings, fishnet stockings, burgundy stockings, argyle stockings, stocking stockings, thick stockings. Couldn't even see the skin through stockings. Especially when she was a nurse or a candy striper. Y'all don't remember that? So I'm, 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 watch this. Anybody got on stockings in church right now? Raise your hand. Four of y'all. Walmart might as well put the stocking department off the counter. They used to wash them stockings too. Now times have changed. But sometimes you got to be able to do your new job and go to your old position. Because God did not bring you out for you to become so arrogant that you cannot go and place your feet in the place that gave your feet foundation. And all of that has happened. And now David is dying. And David is dying and he's laying on his deathbed. Now I'm going to say this without being crude so that you can understand. They put a nurse in the room with him and his body was cold. No blood was circulating. He wanted to, but he couldn't. It wasn't no Viagra then. It wasn't no Cialis. Because you got to be careful asking God for credit for stuff that you don't do because you can't. Come in now, come in now, because y'all going to make me come out there. I'm going to bring this pulpit. I'm going to bring this thing down. I'm going to preach on y'all face. I'm going to step on your toe. Some people want God to give them credit because they don't do stuff no more. You don't do it no more because you don't want to. You don't do it no more because you can't. David looked at that little girl and said, girl, you don't know if I'd have met you 40 years ago, you'd have been in trouble. <laughs> and David now is able to share with us the thorns that come with the throne and the rough texture that comes with elevation. For elevation is not like silk, it is more like sandpaper. That when you are elevated, you have a tendency to rub people wrong. The same people who will show up when you're cold and laying down will be absent when you're warm and standing up. That's why some of you all are frustrated right now because you never thought that you'd be at this place in your life with all of the seeds you had sown and all the people you had helped. You thought that by this stage of your life, when you needed somebody to be there for you, they would be there for you because of all of the people that you were there with. But you didn't understand that when you were growing up and going up, they were frustrated and not happy. That's why when you're, when, you're, when you're being blessed and you've got success, as Elder Stevens, uh, Stephen Taylor said this morning, he said that you've got to learn to be quiet. I, I've got another way of saying that. Did you not know that oysters open their mouth whenever there's a full moon? Every time there is a full moon, an oyster will open its mouth. The crabs also know that. So whenever there's a full moon, they go in and get a rock and they throw it inside of the oyster so that he cannot close his mouth. And then they can go inside of his mouth and eat up the meat. Every time you open your mouth, the devil throws doubt in it so that you can't close it. And he goes inside of your mouth and eat up all of your dreams and eats up all of your hopes. Touch your neighbor and say, be quiet for a season. There are some things that you don't need to speak on yet. That, yeah, some of y'all are dating somebody. I know you're happy, but, but you don't need to post no picture on Instagram yet. You need to keep that thing under wraps. You don't want to give somebody something to attack so fast. You need to be quiet for a season. Most of us don't have the ability of the oyster to have an irritant. You know that pearls are a result of the irritants. That whenever sand or rocks get inside of an oyster's mouth, he takes a material and he wraps around it and spits out a pearl. Most of us don't have the ability to take in irritation and spit out value. 
I want you to walk into a season right now where you can eat on negativity and spit out positivity. I want you to walk into a season of your life where you can feast on ignorance and spit out truth. I want you to walk into your season. I want you to swallow loneliness and send out a signal and let everybody know I'm still happy even though I'm by myself. I need about 500 single women in here that say I took singleness and made a pearl out of it. I took singleness and made a blessing out of it. I took this a long time and found out who I was so I can stop by, stop being identified by what they say I am. David is actually dying early because he saw a girl taking a bath on the rooftop. I'm just amazed that he saw Bathsheba taking a bath. I'm wondering, did he name her and looks at Bathsheba, baby? I'm just, can y'all, I mean, how her name gonna be Bathsheba and he saw her taking a bath? He might have named her and said, he might have said something like this. He would have been like, I want Sheba who's taking a bath. And somebody said, go get Bathsheba. <laughs> That's just how this stuff works, you know? Y'all don't use your imagination when you read the scripture. You won't ever laugh or have fun. That's why I love reading it because I'm crazy and I think this stuff like that. But I don't, I don't think it's, that's too coincidental that he would sleep with Bathsheba and she taking a bath when he sees her. He wants her so bad that he said, go get her and, 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 and take her husband and put her on the front line of the army for the next battle so that when he is killed, I can take his wife. And David was a rascal. That's why I can't understand when people leave churches, when pre preachers make mistakes, you don't stop reading the 23rd number of Psalms. Your 23rd number of Psalms, the one that you quote over and over and over again, was written by a whoremonger, a man who had slept with so many women, they put a woman in the bed with him, and when he didn't roll over and have sex with him, they pronounced him dead, and that's your 23rd number. Don't fold your arms, I ain't scared of you. Say, go get her. Go get old Bathsheba. And the Bible says that they sleep together and they have a son. And the son dies because God will never allow you to produce with something that he didn't pick. And whenever you produce with something that God did not pick, it perishes prematurely. So now... The baby's dead. And the other part of the curse is, David, I'm going to shorten your life. And so now David is dying because of that decision. Now, help me to understand that if David is now dying because he saw a woman and couldn't touch her, why in the world do they think that in order to elongate his life and make him live, bring another woman in that he couldn't touch? It is the fallacy that the thing that cursed you can cure you. There are some people in this room right now that it's the very definition of insanity that whenever you keep trying to do something that's the same and expect to get a different result, you are showing God and the company that you are insane. God is saying in this new year of elevation, you need a new strategy. You cannot do what you did in order to do what you're going to do. You can't go where you went and expect to end up where he wants you to go. Slap three people and say, get a new strategy. You tried dating to make you happy. It didn't do that. So now you got to try praying. Come on, help me, Holy Ghost. It's like women who say, you know, I'm going to go shopping. I got to have shopping therapy. Shopping is not therapeutic. Shopping is costly. And if shopping was therapeutic, why do you have to do it every weekend? Do I need to stay there a little bit? All the husbands are like, come on, Rev, stay in there. Shopping is not therapeutic. Therapy should heal you for an elongated period of time. Anything you have to keep doing and doing and doing and doing and doing and doing is not therapy, it's decision. If you know that eating pork gives you a headache, why would you eat it when you're hungry? It's like you're solving one problem and causing another. 
And you got to get to the place in your life where you use different strategies, where you don't use what you use to get over hurt in the future the way you did in the past. And, and that you got to stop having the same conversations and you got to stop going to the same places and you got to stop relying on the same friends. I'm asking you to change your strategy. I'm asking you to look at what you pick and see if it got you what you chose. Because let me tell you something, all of our lives, every one of us in here, your life is nothing more. Don't let nobody else tell you anything different. Your life is nothing but a sum total of the times you said yes and the times you said no. You are where you are right now because you said yes on the day you said yes and you said no on the day you said no. And if you would have said yes on the day you said no and said no on the day you said yes, you'd be somewhere else. So then the operative lesson is what are you going to say tomorrow? When you're offered an opportunity to be who you were, what will you say? Because you do know that the devil can only give you opportunities on your past. He cannot give you opportunities of your future because he doesn't know what you're going to become. Are y'all with me today? So everybody in here know that we all got to go this way. The Bible says in Hebrews, it was appointed unto man once to die. So we all got to die. And we all got to go to the place where David was. And we all got to wax cold and our eyes are going to go dim. His body has gone cold. And now he is still making decisions on his deathbed. Now, here's the problem. His son, Adoniah, he does what most people do. He waits until you go down to try to go up. His own son is now trying to thwart his own kingdom. Everybody in the house already knows that Solomon was supposed to be the next king. God had already said it. And yet somehow Adoniah thought that because he thought he wanted to be king, he deserved it. And now he's caused a family feud. The whole house is fighting. Everybody's in upheaval. Can you see it? David's dying. Adoniah, he's, he's trying to become king. And Solomon's trying to figure out, do I kill my own brother? Bathsheba's trying to find out, David, are you going to keep your promise because you told me the son we had was going to be king. Can you see all of this going on? There's frustration going on all inside of the house. And by the way, there are two men that David are not feeling good about right now. One of them is Joab and the other one is Abiathar. Now let me tell you about these two guys. Joab is the nephew of David. He kills David's son, Absalom, when Absalom tried to overthrow David. Now this is David's second son in the row that's trying to take his kingdom. Absalom was born, Adoniah was born, and those two sons who were born next to each other, both of them are now trying to take what their daddy had. Can you see how much frustration David has on his deathbed? That he has fed his sons and clothed them all his life, and now at the end they're trying to take it from him. David is probably always wishing, almost wishing, I wish I was dead already. I can't believe what my sons are doing to me. I can't believe what I'm going through. And, and, and here it is, Adonijah comes and, and he offers 50 men to go with him and 50 of them go. And, and, and in the transition letter, I can see David writing to his son Solomon. He says, there are two people I don't want you to trust. I don't want you to trust Joab and I don't want you to trust Abiathar. Abiathar, ladies and gentlemen, is currently the high priest. Now let me tell you why these two are a problem. Now, Absalom tried to take over the kingdom. They were also asked by Absalom to leave and they said, no, they said, no, we are loyal to David. We will not leave David. We don't care what you offer us. We're staying with David. We're going to be at David's church until he died. David always going to be our pastor. Then Adonijah comes and offers them the same thing. Then they both say yes. What happened? Why did they say yes to Adonijah and say no to Absalom? Let me tell you, there is a difference between a loyalist and an opportunist. I ain't trying to shout you today. I want you to hear me. There is a difference between a loyalist and an opportunist. 
The reason why they said no to Absalom and said yes to Adoniah is because there was something on the table for them this time around. And let me tell you something. I don't care what you do. I don't care what you do for people. There is always somebody who will sell you out for a high enough price. People will tell you they'll be there with you forever, but if the price is right, if the price is right, they will leave you where you stand. And here's what the price was. Here's the price. The first guy, Joab, he had already killed Absalom's son. And so Solomon, his daddy told Sol Solomon, David told Solomon, he said, don't trust this guy. Don't trust him because he will kill stuff that you want to live. He said, so don't trust him. Now, the reason why Abiathar defects is because there was a new priest named Zodak who's coming up, and everybody is clapping, and everybody's joining his church, and everybody's listening to him, and now he's coming up. So, so he makes a side deal with, with Adonai and says, now, everybody wants to go to him for the word of the Lord, but if you promise me the position, I'll leave your father to be with you. And, and he didn't want any competition. And so when he promised him the spot, he left his father. I am telling you, I am so tired of new, neutral Christians, I don't know what to do. I'm so tired of people who don't know how to make a decision. I'm so tired of people pretending to be loyalists when they're actually opportunists. When, when somebody gives them the opportunity, they will leave you. I have told people this this morning, and I want to tell you right now, you need to make sure that every person in your life picks a gear. They either need to pick drive or they need to pick reverse. I am so tired of people in neutral. People who are in neutral will go whichever way the road goes. If they're on the back side of the hill, they'll go backwards. If they're on the front side of the hill, they'll go forward. But slap your neighbor and say, pick a gear. Make sure that the people in your life pick a gear. Either pick drive and drive in my life or pick reverse and get out of my life. But whatever you do, pick a gear. I wish I had somebody in here who understands that you don't need neutral people in your life, that you need to make people make a decision so you'll know what you have. I listen to people all the time who want enemy-free lives. Let me tell you, you need enemies. Enemies make you pray. Enemies make you stay on your P's and Q's. God doesn't give you enemies to hurt you. He gives you enemies so that you'll pay attention to your mistakes. Don't, don't miss what I just said. The only reason why you have enemies is they're the only people in your life who make you cross your T's and dot your I's. Your friends will let you do whatever you want to do, and you'll make mistakes in front of them. But God will insert some enemies to make sure that you won't be as wild as you can be and won't do what you feel like doing all the time. Do I have anybody here that'll say amen to that? So your haters ain't all bad. Some of them are helpful. Because if it wasn't for your haters, you would have posted that picture. You knew you shouldn't have posted. But you thought about it. It's like, no, nah, they're going to be on it. Now. And that was God's way of blessing you from embarrassing yourself. Are y'all praying with me today? So, so, so these defections are shocking. I can't believe they left them. I'm going to tell you something. As I lecture with you this morning, there are going to be some people who leave you. You're going to be shocked. You're gonna, you, you would have clothed them and they will leave you. They would have stayed in your house. You would have babysat their children and they will leave you. They will leave you with stuff you let them borrow and won't bring it back. These are the people who you have let drive your car. People you grew up with, they will leave you. But you have to be okay with vacating people. You have to be okay with people leaving you because every person that God gave you was not intended to be forever. They leave. I know that David was sad. I would have been sad. He probably couldn't admit it because he was a king, but we can admit it. We're we in a conversation. It's just me and you. Wouldn't you be, aren't you sad when people leave? Are, are you sad when people leave? It, this, this, was, this, was, this was shocking, and they get to a place, and, and now they get to this situation where Adonai is like, well, I'm going to be king. I don't care what they say. I'm going to be king. I don't care if Solomon is supposed to be king or not. I'm going to be the next king, and I'm not worried about what my father has to say. So what he does is he goes to a place called Ingra, and he begins to throw a party for himself. And let me tell you something about positions. Any position that you pick for yourself is not authentically yours. Elevation always comes by invitation. You don't have to make it happen. Let God. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Let God do it. Just touch somebody and say, I know it's simple, but let God do it. You don't have to get somebody fired so you can get a promotion. You stop, stop telling all the time and going in that, going in the, the manners of all the time. You ain't heard this. Anytime you got to start a sentence where you ain't heard this from me, shut up. 
Because if you ain't brave enough for them to say that you said it and for it to come back to you, you ain't got no business saying it. Why are you hiding your hand talking about, I'm going to tell you, but it didn't come from me. Yeah. Slap somebody and say, own your words. Own your words. You should never say nothing that you got to start with. Well, you ain't heard this from me. Are you hearing me? Touch your name and say, we ain't going to shout today. We ain't going to shout. Y'all didn't shout doing an offering. Don't look to shout doing a sermon. We shouted this morning, though. They be shouting every week in the morning. They shout every week in the morning. I would think y'all would shout more. Y'all got more sleep. But I think y'all like lecturing more than preaching, so I'm going to give you what you need. Touch your name and say, give the people what they want. Hey, who said that? Hey. I told y'all the ratchet is for the end. Y'all be trying to get it out early, man. Hold on, bro. So, 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 Adonai is over there throwing his party at Ingram. Solomon is at the other well. Some theologians say that the parties were only 300 feet away from each other. They not even far. Like, he didn't even have the decency to go over to the next town. He like, I'm going to be king, I'm going to take your place, and I'm going to do it in your face. Ooh, bold people need to be stolen on sometimes, don't they? Like, you just going to come up in here, dog, and just, just try to take my position, and you going to do it in my face, cuz? So he's going over there and they start having a party and Solomon's over here having his party and, and they're having conflicting parties. But the two places, although they are close, they are so far apart in contrast. It is the era of thinking that because things are close, they are the same. See, that's why you have to be careful who you are close to because whenever you are close to a thing you don't agree with, don't be mad at us when we assume you're the same. I'm a, I, if, I could just, if I could just stop right up and through there, and preach, I get so tired of people who hang out with my enemies and want me to believe they my friends. You cannot hang out with somebody I don't fool with and say we fool with each other. Slap somebody and say, you cannot be my enemy's friend and mine at the same time. You got to make a choice. You got to pick. Even Jesus says, choose ye this day who you will serve. Somebody shout, make a choice. Come on, say it again. Make a choice. Whatever you're going to do, make a choice. That's why the Bible says, John says in Revelation chapter 3, to the church of Laodicea, I would that you would be hot or that you would be cold. But if you are lukewarm, Lord, help me with five Bible readers. If you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. God told me to tell you every lukewarm person makes him throw up. And this is what the Bible says. I would that you be hot or cold. He didn't say hot and cold. He says hot or cold. In other words, either one of them are good, but you can't be both. And the reason why he said hot or cold is a theological conundrum that also is associated with the perfunctity of the test because there are actually two things that are going on at the same time. There are the warm waters of Heropolis and the cool waters of Colossia, and they will meet in a swell in the middle. And he says, I would rather you be cold like the waters of Heropolis, which were good for healing, or would be warm like the waters of Colossia and be good for soothing, but either be soothing or be therapeutic, but don't be in the middle. Because anybody in the middle is somebody who can't make a decision. Just pick. Pick. You're going to be nice or mean. Pick. Come on, y'all. Somebody say pick. pick. You're going to be old or young. You ever see old people act young, young people act old, be one of them. Ain't nothing worse than seeing somebody who, who old, still dressing old, acting like they're young. We just look at them like, man, you don't have no idea, do you? Young people do not wear bell bottoms and leather jackets with big collars on them no more. We just don't. Somebody shout, pick. pick. You couldn't pick. Just because it's close don't mean it's the same. And when you're close to somebody and you keep talking about you ain't like them, it's hard to tell. 
Oh, y'all ain't listening to me today. I know this is a good sermon. I'm not preaching better than you acting, but I know it's convicting. That's why y'all can't say amen. But it's, it's what happened in Rehoboam's house. When Rehoboam had left, the Bible says the thieves broke into the castle and they stole his golden shields and then they replaced them with brass shields and they buffed them up and shined them up real good so that when he would walk in the house, he would know that they had stolen his golden shields because he would look at the brass shields and whenever you shine fakeness, it looks real. Some of y'all walking with a fake shield right now and don't even know it because they dress up and shine up and they speak well, but underneath that is a tarnished soul. When he invites everybody to come, there are three people who refuse the invitation. Nathan, Abinadad, and Solomon, they don't come. They like, we are loyal to your father. We are not opportunists, we are loyalists, and it doesn't matter how many invitations you give us, we are not coming. Why? Because you cannot invite real people to fake ceremonies. You ain't gotta say nothing, I'm preaching up in this house. Preach, Keon, I think I will. I can tell who you are by what invitations you accept. There ought to be some people who invite you to places you ought to not be able to go because of your loyalty to your friend. How are you going to go over somebody's house that you know can't stand your mama and you in that time out, I'm in the middle. I'm going to help you not be in the middle. Get all the way over there. Some of y'all need to help people to choose a side. Whenever somebody's being neutral and you sitting on somebody to wait and choose you, you need to help them make a choice. Just tell them, go, because I refuse to make you my priority while you make me an option. So slap your name and say, you don't have to pick, I'll pick for you. Go! I'm just waiting to see who he gonna choose. I'm going to help you choose. I choose them for you. Somebody shout, somebody shout, help them choose, help them choose, help them choose. Nathan said, I ain't going. I don't care what position you offer me, I ain't going. I'd rather be unemployed on the right side than a job on the wrong side. And I'm not saying that it doesn't come a choice. Every time, every, every person gets in a life where, where you have to make a decision for you and go to, I'm talking about people who leave before God says go. If it wasn't for God saying go, I would have never started this church. I didn't leave to start this church. I left because God told me to do it. And wherever God tells you to go, he'll give provision when you execute his vision. And all of you all are here today, proof positive that God told me to come. If God sends you, there'll be people waiting on you. If God sends you, there, the contract will already be signed. If God sends you, the interest rate will be where you need it to be. If God sends you, everything will be in line. If God sends you, when you go through the door, you'll be welcome. When God sends you, people already know your name before you get in. When God sends you, it'll be an open part when God sends you. But when you got to go in, passing out business cards and introducing yourself to everybody and trying to steal clients from other people, you went, you weren't sent. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Y'all gonna make me preach and I was gonna lecture, but I feel the Holy Ghost starting to move up in my belly right now. I feel the Holy Ghost moving because whenever y'all look at me like that, it make me want to fight back. When God has called you, they know who you are when you arrive. When we started this church, I didn't pass out now. How many of y'all got a business card for me? Not a one of you because I ain't never had one. I didn't go on nobody church talking about, the Lord, you know, I'm starting up a new church and, and God told me to tell you to move on over here with me and, and I got a new word from the Lord. I ain't got no new word. I got the same old one that I've been having since I was 14. Ain't nothing new under the sun. Talking about somebody telling you they got a new word. How you gonna make something new that's old? You don't need a new word. You need a new revelation. Y'all here with me today. Touch your name and say, he didn't hurt my feelings. I used to get mad when my friends wouldn't invite me to stuff. Because I used to be, you know, I used to like to hang out. Because I've always been this, this person in this place of insecurity. Because, you know, when you're a preacher, they don't like you go nowhere. Because they think that if they cuss, you're going to be offended. And they think if, if they drink, that you're going to be offended. But they didn't know that I like both.
Huh? No, I'm being serious. I've been pre you, you don't start preaching at 14 and be perfect. I was 14 years old. I was looking for a young virgin like David. I can't preach to no neutral Christians. Can y'all make a decision? Either you're going to be hood like me or you're going to be too urbane, but you got to make a choice. I'm 14. And my hoop skills was dope. So here I am with these dope hoop skills. This wet jumper that I still got. True. This is a true story, dog, for real. <laughs> cool as ice, twice as nice, ain't never had a bad day in my life. And God called me to preach. I told the Lord, you don't want to do that. <laughs> oh, no, didn't I, mama? I, I, I used to play church, all three, these are my three sisters right here. I used to play church. Now, my sister Danielle, she used to be my nurse. All right, so whenever I used to preach, I used to do like James Brown. I'd be hooping, and the Bible says, uh, ain't God all right? Oh, yeah. I used to do all that, and then she'd come and put a towel on me, and I'd come out, ah! Hoo -hoo, yeah. How many of y'all remember that kind of preaching? They don't do that no more, but they used to slow ground it, and the, the Bible says. Y'all remember that? And I used, to, I used to preach like that. I used to do all of that, and I used to holler and scream and do all of that kind of stuff, and she'd put it and bring me my water, and I was drinking water. Now, now my sister Kiana, she was in the choir. <laughs> Ebony, I don't know if I got her saved while I was preaching. We were trying to bring her in, but I think she's saved now. She came to church sometime. Other times she didn't come to the fellowship. <laughs> this is the truth. I'm not making enough. Sometimes we would have church and shit like, well, y'all let me know when y'all done. <laughs> so, I'm preaching at 14, passing at 21. You think I went in polished? I'm like, Lord, don't pick me. This ain't going to be good for neither one of us. I'm going to embarrass you because I, I am a fool and I don't know what to do and, 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 I'm, and I'm ghetto and I, ain't, I can't speak well and, and, and I, I, I failed math and I graduated uh, summer cum laude. <laughs> I got some good grades and some I didn't and, 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 and I was a C student and, you know, this ain't going to be good, God. I'm going to embarrass you. Plus, I ain't got that much discipline, Jesus. And God said, I want you anyway. Because everybody I'm going to send to the lighthouse is just like you. <laughs> just trying to make it. Hoping that God will bless them. Trying to get over the same problems and the same issues. Give your neighbor a high five and say, I'm just like you. But thank God that he looks beyond my faults and sees my needs. Somebody ought to spend about 30 seconds giving God glory that he doesn't pick you like other people pick you, that you can go from next to now in the heartbeat. Somebody shout, thank you, God. And I started realizing the reason why I wasn't getting invited. And I, and I used to go through this with my daughter who just graduated from college. I'd go through this. Sometimes, you know, she was, she was doing so good and she did better in school than I could have ever done. And people started turning their back on her. And I told her, baby, listen, sometimes you don't get invited because they know you have too much character to sit in the foolishness with them. And I came to tell somebody in here, don't worry about these invitations you are not getting. They have already gotten amongst themselves and said, well, we're going to go, but we can't invite her because we're going to be drinking and we're going to be smoking and we're going to be gossiping and she's not going to do that. There are some invitations that you didn't get because you grew up. Ah, I wish I had somebody who had the Holy Ghost. There are some invitations that you didn't get because you grew up, because you learned to control your tongue, because you stopped gossiping, because you got over some stuff. If you would have gotten invited, it would have proved that you were the same. Some invitations you ought to be glad you didn't get. And it hurt, don't it? Does it make you feel like, man, why, what's wrong with me? It's almost 
a reflection of the rejection you felt, which is why you chose them to be friends. But you got to be careful with the lookalike. I'm going back to it. The shields of gold are the shield of brass. Sometimes the Bible says you cannot tell the difference between the wheat and the tare. So whenever they would pick the wheat, they had to be careful because the tare had wrapped itself in the foundation of the wheat and there is no way to rip the tear without ripping the wheat. Sometimes you can be so wrapped up in the wrong thing that God can't hurt them without hurting you. And you'll be wondering why did this happen to me? Because you were too close to the weed. That's why you got to get all of the weeds out of your garden when it's early before they grab roots. If you ever notice, if I pick my own weeds out of my lawn, yes, I can get somebody to do it, but it's therapeutic for me. I go out there and I pick my own weeds and I always pick them the day I see them because when you pick them the day you see them, they slide right up. When you leave them in there, they bring up a whole bunch of dirt with them. Some people that in, you done left them in your life so long, they can't leave without your soil. They don't leave without your mind. They don't leave without your hope. They don't leave without your phone number. They don't leave without having made other relationships with people you had relationships with before they come in your life. Now when they leave you, they take 50 people with them. That's why you got to learn to get people out of your life early. Huh? Who am I helping? I gotta let y'all go, I'm 45 seconds over time. Let me just stop right now. As you know, people be coming to church and they're like, oh, I wanna be out at a certain time, you know, they, you know, they got a secret sensitive church and God is able and they get 90 minutes. I wanna be out of church in 90 minutes and suffer for seven days. You suffer seven days and then come and put God on the clock. You ain't put the devil on one. Come on, talk at your boy. You didn't wish that they closed the club when you was there yesterday. You was talking about last call. Oh, y'all, they done? Let me go get my home. You weren't you ready to go there. Don't get on my nerves, man. I be getting attitude, man. I'm sorry. Please be patient with me. God ain't through with me yet, man. I don't never see nobody put the devil on the clock. Go to the concert, encore, encore, one more, woo! Sermon, mm, Popeye's gonna be, they, they lying starting about 15, trying to get up there and get that chicken before they run out. I'm trying to help. I promise you I'm trying to help. Am I helping you make some noise? I just, that's the only reason why I come. I love to have fun. I like to joke around. But if I ain't helping you, I will sit down and shut up. Solomon said, I'm, I'm supposed to be king. Bathsheba said, I tell you what, I'm going to go have a talk with David. He might be seen now, right now. I'm gonna see if I can go help him remember what he said. You went there and said, David, Davy, how you doing? Now, you know, Nathan, Nathan said, I'll go with you, but I'm gonna stand behind you. You know, women ain't scared to just bust up in the scene. You know, when, see, if you ever want something done, you send a woman in first. So I'm telling you right now. Yeah, that woman, she said, she say, I'm, go, I'm, I'm gonna go talk to him. I know he's a king and I know he can kill me, but this is my baby. How many women know when it comes to your child? A woman will turn into a gorilla about her son. Oh, you mess with a woman's child? That's one thing. But you mess with her son? A woman will rip your heart out of your finger about her son. Now, her daughter, she might say, I know she liked that. I, she remind me of myself. But you mess with her boy, and, and she going to move the furniture and bust your head to the white meat. I promise you that. <laughs> Women, if I'm talking true, make some noise up in here. The women go up in there and tell that principal, he might be bad and he might have did it, but you should have called me and told me and let me get him together. Because I don't allow nobody to be putting their hands on my son. You heard me?
Mm. And, and rollers and flip flops. They didn't mess around and let kids get cell phones now so the kids can call their mama and say, Mama, they messing with me up here. See, we had to wait till the teacher sent a letter home for mama to find out. Now they can text mama and say, Mama, the teacher just said something bad about me. I'm on my way up there. I know they didn't. <laughs> get up there and find out he wrong. And boy, let me tell y'all kids something. Don't mess around and be wrong. You will get the beating of your life. She gonna defend you in that office, but the whole time she's like, oh, he did. Oh, y'all do have it on tape. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Driving home, you're just quiet. He's sitting over there telling her, mama, I ain't, <laughs> ain't no sense of crying. I ain't gave you nothing to cry yet. You better shut up before I give you something to cry about. How many of y'all had a mama that did not let you cry until she gave you something? You cry about, and then beat the life out of you and say this, now shut up. What you want me to do? My mama beat me so bad one time, I said, mama, mama, my blood hurt. She said, you should have thought about that before you set that trash can on fire in the bathroom. Lord Jesus. One time, y'all, I set the trash can on fire in the bathroom and, and it burnt the bottom of the trash can out. And, and I kept it in place so my mama couldn't see it. And she said, I smell smoke. I said, I don't know who that is. <laughs> she ain't know right away, but the trash can filled up and I was dumping it regularly so she wouldn't know, but this time I forgot. <laughs> she went in there and tried to pick up the garbage can and dump it and picked it up and all the trash was on the ground. They said, who did, them jokers, Keon did it. <laughs> Mama say, now, nah, go get my belt. I don't whoop no clothes, so go and take them off. Lean over that couch, and you better not move. <laughs> Near the cross, cross be my glory ever oh, teach my raptured soul shall find rest beyond some of y'all don't know nothing about that song and you know they was good and real good when you ever had a, 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 a director in the choir and be like, rest. Rest, rest. Rest, rest. Rest, 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 rest. I done lost it. I'm, I'm done. I got to go. I got to go. I have lost it. <laughs> I gotta go, man. I gotta go. I gotta go. I gotta go. <laughs> Y'all can tell I don't get outside much. So, so, uh, so, so, Abinadad, he says, I'm gonna be the king. And, and this is what he does. He says, I want y'all to do me a favor. Go get all the horses. Bring them. I'm riding in on these horses. I'm gonna get this thing. Now, let me tell you something. He, he didn't even know he was making a mistake. See, when people want something too bad, they skip over steps. He didn't, know he, he didn't know he was making a mistake because the law of Moses said that a king was forbidden to have a horse. So he goes and gets a horse, which initially makes him an illegitimate king. It's the reason why Absalom did not become king because when he wanted to become king, he went and got a horse. So now he follows bad advice. And now he goes and gets a horse not recognizing that David did not have a horse, he had a mule. So he says, y'all go tell Solomon the way to avert and to show the people who really is king is I'll tell him the game. It's not the one who comes in on the horse that's gonna be the next king, it's the one that comes in on the mule. Now let me tell you, there is another king that when he came in on Palm Sunday, he did not come in on the horse. The Bible said he came in on a donkey that had never been ridden because the way to go up is to go down. 
Slap your neighbor and say, those who make themselves humble will be made great. And those who make themselves great will be made humble. God says, get off of your high horse and get on your mule. Hmm. You don't have to worry about your spot. It's already yours. I know the plans I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you. I would in all things that you would prosper and be in good health. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? He, is a sh he, he already knows how this thing is going to end up for you. You don't have to be an Adonai. You don't have to jockey for a position. You don't have to put anybody else down to go up. All you got to do is stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The position is already yours. The plan is already yours. The situation is already handled. You just wait on the Lord. I say again, wait. God said, you're going to go from next to now. And you better be ready. Because even though you're now, there's somebody who wants to steal your next. And I'm not looking for the one who comes in on a horse. I'm looking for one who's coming on the lowly mule. I want to say to every person in this place today, if you only knew what God was going to do with you, you wouldn't be worried like you worried. <laughs> you, you, you paying attention to the 50 who leaving you instead of paying attention to the three that stayed. I am not speaking as one who has apprehended this, but this one thing I know. Forgetting those things which are behind me, I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward call. You got to get to a point in your life, and I know it's hard because it was hard for me and it still is sometimes, that you just got to be delivered from caring about what people think. And I'm not a... 100% there yet, I, I'm, I'm about 99 and a half percent, but I'm not 100% there every once in a while, I still care, but, and it hurts. But for the most part, I cannot make my decisions by people who don't have my situation. The problem is, is you're letting people who have never risen to the level of your anointing to help you make a decision. You're who God's counting on to take this thing. The kingdom is yours. And the kingdom of heaven is suffer violence, and the violent take it by force. You got to go get it. Nobody's going to give you a business. You got to start it. That book you keep talking about writing, start it. That business you keep saying, I don't have the money to start, start it and see when God send the finances. Because no weapon formed against you will ever be able to prosper. And if you would stop paying attention to all of the music and all of the noise and the fact that somebody's applauding them and, and in order to applaud them, they got, you stop requiring people to be mad at somebody else because you mad at them. Just, just live your life and go forward and know that he's God and know that all things are going to work out together for your good no matter what happens. You got to be courageous. You got to be steadfast and unmovable, always abounding. You got to walk by faith and not by sight. And you got to believe it when you can't see it. And you got to be willing to make decisions in your deathbed. Oh, everybody wanted to be David. Everybody wanted to be king. I wish they would have knew the end of the story before the beginning. I wish for every person who wanted to be David, Absalom, you wasn't willing for your daughter to be raped and for two of your sons to be killed and for your life to be shortened and for a giant to try to kill you and for the Philistines to try to overthrow you. You wanted my position, but you didn't want my pain. And Absalom, I am here to tell you that you almost overthrew me, but the problem was you couldn't even stay alive long enough to be me. 
How are you going to be me and you couldn't even stay alive long enough to get to see it? Absalom was born after David and died before he died. Everybody sees everything that they want that you have, but they don't know what you have gone through. I want to be married 20 years like you, so that means you want to forgive when you don't feel like you've done nothing wrong and you want to come home when you don't feel like it and you want to sleep next to somebody you can't stand and you want to feed somebody you wish that would starve to death. That's what you want? Oh, I want, a, I want a nice, cute little baby just like you. So you mean to tell me you want to go to the emergency room at 3 o'clock in the morning and find out whether this is a lump or a bump or, or a temperature you want, you want to go? You, you see my end result. You ain't see my process. If you're going to go from next to now, you got to endure the process. If you're in the process, I want you to stand to your feet right now. No.